From Microbe TV, this is Beyond the Noise, episode number 43, recorded on July 25th, 2024. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and joining me today is your host, Dr. Paul Offit. Hi, Vincent. This is the video version of Paul's column on Substack called Beyond the Noise, Cutting to the Chase on Important Health Topics. Today, we're going to take a closer look at Paul's latest column, Restoring Faith in Vaccines. A recent op-ed in the New England Journal of Medicine offered a solution that is readily available, but unlikely to succeed. So let's start, Paul, by having you tell us what is the op-ed's solution for restoring faith in vaccines. But so the point of view of this opinion piece in the New England Journal of Medicine was that during the COVID pandemic, there was a loss of trust in vaccines and that that trust could be restored or at least largely restored had we been better able to identify safety problems more quickly and define their biological mechanisms. That was the, the, the point of view of the piece. Um, I don't agree with that. I, I don't think that's why people lost trust. Um, the, the, what happened uh, in this country was um, in December of 2020, we had two mRNA vaccines available, and that over the next seven months or so, um, we inoculated roughly 70% of the U.S. population, which was remarkable because we didn't have an infrastructure for mass vaccinating adults, but we did that. Then we hit a wall. By July of 2021, we hit a wall. 30% of this country simply refused to be vaccinated. And I don't think that was because we um, weren't quick enough at identifying safety problems, because we were. I mean, when the mRNA vaccines came out in December of 2020, within a couple months, uh, we were able to find through the Vaccine Adverse Events Reporting System these increased uh, case reports of myocarditis or inflammation of the heart muscle, and then through the Vaccine Safety Data Link identified it as causing a problem in 1 in 50,000 people. That's a rare event that wasn't going to be picked up pre-authorization, but was picked up quickly post-authorization. Similarly, with J&J's vaccine, the adenovirus vector vaccine, which was uh, authorized in February of 2021, was very quickly found to be a cause of clotting, including severe clotting, including occasionally fatal clotting in the brain. And that was picked up quickly, verified by the vaccine safety data link to be a problem in one in 250,000 people. And the biological mechanism was defined as being associated with activating this so-called platelet factor four. So, um, I don't think that reassured people because I think that's not why people don't trust vaccines. So you don't agree that the COVID pandemic caused the loss of faith in vaccines based on the 70% uptake of the vaccine? No, I think there was a loss of faith. I, th I think there was a loss of faith for several reasons. I think the biggest reason was mandates. I, I, I mm -hmm. think people don't like to have the government telling them what to do. Don't like to have the government telling them they, they can't go to work, they can't go to a sporting event, they can't go to their uh, place of religious observance. Um, unless they get vaccinated. I think that was viewed as government overreach. And I think what you're seeing is the pushback from that as we sort of leaned into this libertarian left hook. I think also people um, don't like it that there's any sort of safety problem, in including a severe adverse event. They, they believe that we should know enough about science and medicine now that we would anticipate that and that you shouldn't see it. And, and to mandate then vaccines where there is a safety problem is just sort of a, a double effect there. So I, I think that's why. And I think um, people don't, some people will not accept any sort of safety problem, um, no matter how uh, quickly defined or how quickly the biological uh, uh, risk is defined. So I think that's all part of it. And the other reason people don't trust vaccines, I think, is that there are people who believe that vaccines cause serious adverse events, like autism, for example. And, and even though study after study after study will show that vaccines don't cause autism, they still believe that the uh, medical uh, establishment uh, is, isn't doing its job because they're not recognizing something they know to be true. So in your article, you have four issues that you discuss, which you think are going to be um, an impediment to this idea of restoring faith in viruses. Let's let's go through those. It's it's useful to talk about them. The first one is you've mentioned already. Some people don't trust the system that fails to acknowledge vaccine harms when such harms don't exist, arguing that vaccines cause a variety of chronic diseases that the medical establishment is simply unwilling to admit. How do we deal with that? I think we we. 
to deal with it the best way we can, which is take the measles, mumps, rubella vaccine as a cause of autism as an example. Um, it's a reasonable question to ask, right? My child's fine. They got a vaccine. Now they have signs and symptoms of autism. Could the vaccine have done that? That's an answerable question. It's a scientific question. It can be answered in a scientific venue. And we've done that. I think the public health community, the academic community, stepped forward and has done roughly 18 studies, a dozen and a half studies, uh, looking at children who did or didn't get that vaccine retrospectively. Obviously, you can't do that as a prospective study. It would be unethical. And, and, and identified, sort of, you know, make sure that those two groups were like in all other aspects of healthcare seeking behavior, socioeconomic background, medical background. So you can isolate the effect of that one variable receipt of the MMR vaccine. It's been done 18 times in seven countries on three continents and tens of millions of dollars have been spent to answer those parents' questions and, and I think most people actually were convinced by that. Uh, there was a study done by the Autism Science Foundation when Andrew Wakefield first brought up the notion that MMR vaccine caused autism, where about 90% of parents of children with autism thought vaccines could do it. Now it's probably closer to 10%. So the good news is I think many people are convinced, but not all. What, besides autism, what other chronic diseases are people blaming on vaccines? Well, any sort of chronic neurological disorder, uh, attention deficit disorder, hyperactivity disorder, mm -hmm. and then other sort of generally autoimmune disease, multiple sclerosis, diabetes, um, the, the, those sorts of chronic diseases. I mean, that's sort of RFK Jr.'s bailiwick. He says, look, we have all these chronic diseases. I think vaccines are causing these chronic diseases. I think we should spend all our money studying that. Isn't it more likely that infections cause the chronic diseases and not the, not the vaccines that are designed to prevent disease? Well, well we do study that. Uh, we have studied whether yeah. vaccines cause multiple sclerosis or whether vaccines cause diabetes because the, the haemophilus influenza type B vaccine was claimed to cause diabetes. That wasn't true. So, so we do look. Whenever it comes up, I think people do look, but it's like whack-a-mole. You can never kind of get to the end. And then, then you get to the sort of untestable hypothesis, which is too many vaccines given too soon cause autism, and we should do a trial of vaccinated children and unvaccinated children. Well, you certainly can't prospectively do that trial because if you have a group of unvaccinated children, they're at high risk for getting vaccine-preventable diseases. And so people say, well, just do it retrospectively. But you can't do that either because those, those two groups are unlikely to be the same in terms of their healthcare seeking behavior. Another point you bring up is that others believe that serious vaccine safety issues should be detected before a vaccine is authorized, even when the problem is so rare it couldn't possibly be detected until millions of people had been vaccinated. So is there a solution to that? No. I mean, the only solution you can have is to have systems in place that very quickly pick up safety problems. I I'm, was fortunate enough to be on the FDA's Vaccine Advisory Committee when we sit, sat down in December of 2020 to consider those two mRNA vaccines. Pfizer's trial was a 40,000-person trial, a prospective placebo control, which meant 20,000 people got the vaccine. Moderna's was a 30,000-person trial, which meant, again, placebo control, so 15,000 people got the vaccine. That means that roughly... 35,000 people had gotten an mRNA vaccine, a vaccine for which we had no previous experience, right? We had never used an mRNA vaccine before. And now you're about to make a recommendation for hundreds of millions of people. All of us, I think everybody who sat around that table um, at, at the uh, FDA's Vaccine Advisory Committee meeting knew there was going to be a rare problem. That had to be true. The only question was how rare and how serious. But the good news is both for myocarditis and then the later for uh you know, for the clotting problem associated with Johnson & Johnson's adenovirus vector vaccine, those were picked up very quickly. In a better world, people would appreciate that there are systems in place to pick up rare adverse events because you can't do a 5 million person trial pre-licensure. That's just not um, feasible. Well, Jonas Salk did a big clinical trial for an activated polio vaccine. I, I don't remember the numbers, but there were more than 40,000. Couldn't we do a half a million person uh, trial then? Right. So that's what he did. He did, did a had 400,000 people got children, got the polio vaccine, 200,000 right. children served as, as, uh, as got placebo, meaning saline, and then 1.2 million children served as observed on an mm -hmm. control. So it was a 1.8 million child study. Uh, if you did that child, that study today, a roughly 1.8 million child study would probably cost about $3 billion. Hmm. 
as opposed to what's the cost of a 40,000 person trial? Well, so, so I mean, I was involved with the rotavirus vaccine trial, which was a 70,000 person trial. That was a $350 million trial. Okay, that's a good point. All right, the next point, um, some aren't willing to accept any serious vaccine side effects, no matter how quickly defined, well understood, or uncommon. Is there any solution to that? But I think we, um, we have an unusual view of risk. I think that um, when you say to somebody that, that you have, that there's a risk of one in 10, or one in 50,000, or one in 250,000, or one in 10 million, I think what most people hear is the one, that it could happen to you. And I think that um, we don't, we, we tend to rate the risk of something that you give, that you take or you give to your child as much greater than not doing anything and then having the virus do that. Whereas in fact, it's the same. I mean, if a child is hurt, they're hurt either way. And so you want to take the, the least risky path possible. But there are never risk-free choices. There's just choices to take different risks. And I would argue that a choice not to get a vaccine is the more serious risk because you risk what's going to happen with the virus. I mean, the, the I'll give you another example. The um, New York State Lottery, at least years ago, when they were selling uh, lottery tickets at, at a, a point, one point where your chance of winning was like 14 million to one, were able to sell tickets with the phrase, it can happen to you. <laughs> I think that's how people see this. It can. You could be that one. Right. So really what we need to do is teach people how to understand the balance of risk versus benefit which maybe we haven't done such a good job on. Maybe we need to do better. Right, and it's the sin of omission versus the sin of commission. That, that you, if you give your child a vaccine and something awful happens, you feel terrible. Whereas if you don't give the child a vaccine and the child gets the infection and something terrible happens, um, you know, I guess that there's a different way of perceiving that, that you didn't do it, that something else did it. And maybe that's the difference. And the last point you made is many reject the notion of vaccine mandates. They don't like the government telling them what to do. And in fact, it's become a political issue. So what's your solution for that? I think in retrospect, um, we were too heavy handed about mandates. I, I, I can certainly understand why we did it. I was completely in support of it. I mean, in in 2021, you were 12 times more likely to be hospitalized and die if you didn't get vaccinated than if you did. Our hospital was overwhelmed with, with SARS-CoV-2 virus, you know, the cause of COVID. And we, we canceled elective surgeries. It was all hands on deck. People were working double shifts. And it was a little galling that people were making a choice not to get vaccinated and then become seriously ill and then became a, a, a tremendous burden to the healthcare system. I mean, we were doing everything we could to flatten the curve so that we could take care of all our, our patients. And and so mandating vaccines made sense. You shouldn't have the right to catch and transmit a potentially fatal infection. That shouldn't be your choice, frankly. But I think by doing it the way we did it, I think we created this enormous backlash that has now spilled over, and, and not only to involve COVID vaccines, or frankly, mandates for uh, for masking, but for any vaccines. And I really do fear that we are on the verge of starting to erode school vaccine mandates. That's already started to happen. And, um, and you're seeing the evidence for that in the increased numbers of measles cases. So do, do, do you think that, what is the number of people who would have taken the COVID vaccine without a mandate? I don't know. I mean, I think that's 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 the question that really needs to be answered. But I do think even CDC people, when I've talked to them recently, wondered whether, in retrospect, this was the right thing to do. But your point's a good one. I mean, if if were, were people who were who got the vaccine would have gotten it anyway, whether it was mandated or not. So you're talking about people who didn't want to get the vaccine and had to get mandated, had to get the vaccine to be mandated. I can tell you, there was one couple I remember um, in 2021, early. Um, there was a um, the, the the it was an adolescent boy who could have gotten the vaccine. It was because it was after May. You could get a vaccine over 12 years of age, and he was like 17, May of 2021. So he could have gotten the vaccine, didn't. Um, his mother never got vaccinated. The siblings, who were also of an age where they could have been vaccinated, weren't vaccinated. And I remember talking to the family as we were going from the floor up to the intensive care unit, and the father was vaccinated. And I asked him, why? And he just said casually, well, I had to be for work. All right. Well, you know, Paul, there are some countries that do not mandate, that did not mandate vaccines during COVID. And most, for example, Sweden did not. And most people realized that it was a good thing to do. So we have a unique situation in this country. As you know, people want their freedom. 
Right. It's a country founded on individual rights and freedoms, which the problem there is the individual. <laughs> Some individuals um, just uh, don't see themselves as part of a whole. I mean, the Scandinavian countries generally don't don't uh, mandate vaccines, yet immunization rates are very high because they trust the, the health care system. They pu- trust public health agencies. They trust doctors. No, it's hard to believe there's any place in the world like that, but they do trust public health in, in Scandinavian countries. So uh, this, uh, this op-ed opinion piece says we should spend more money on post-authorization safety studies using the $4.3 billion available in the vaccine injury compensation program. But it seems to me that we already do post-licensure studies, right? Yeah, no, you could always do more. Uh, so I think that the, the um, recommendation, I remember when I was on the Advisory Committee for Immunization Practices back in the early 2000s, I actually made that recommendation to the executive secretary at the time, it was Dixie Snyder. I say, look, we have all this excess money in this fund. Why don't we use it to study safety? And the Congress would have to, to then change the way that that money is set aside, because this is all part of the National Childhood Vaccine Injury Act, which was passed in 1986 under the Reagan administration. And both the Vaccine Adverse Events Reporting System and the Vaccine Injury Compensation Program are part of that act. And so this is the money that's just accruing in theory, to to uh, be able to compensate people who really are hurt uh, by by serious adverse events associated with vaccines, but you would have to then change the way the wording of that uh, that program is done in order to spend that money for something else. But um, so it, it was considered then. It just would, the kind of, this would have to be an act of Congress. So, do you think that the adverse events of the the side effects of the mRNA vaccines and the adenovirus vectored vaccines could have been picked up earlier with more money in the program? I don't think so. No, I think it was picked up very quickly. Okay. All right, we'll put a link in the show notes to this column. You can go and read it for yourself. That's Beyond the Noise with Dr. Paul Offit. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Vincent. (laughs) 